Hello there, Sharks. I'm Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com, and today we're going to talk about how to win when you're card dead. I realize a lot of you have been working hard. You've been in the gym. You're getting all fit. You know how to play poker well, and when you go to the casino to play or when you load up an online session, you're ready to play. But sometimes you get no cards at all. So what do you do? First, you have to understand that your goal should not be to win a specific hand or even in a session, but instead to make long-term profitable decisions. If you think about live poker, right? Let's say you're going to get up, go to the casino and play 2-5 No Limit Hold'em, or you're going to play a $500 buy-in tournament. Typically, you're only going to play something like 30, 35, or 40 hands per hour, depending on how fast your table plays, which is not a whole lot of hands. If you think about it, imagine you're supposed to play 20% of hands on average. That's 20 out of 100, right? You're going to play 20 hands over the course of roughly three hours on average, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. You get what I'm saying, though. That means you're going to play roughly six or seven hands per hour. And it's really easy to just not get any of those six or seven hands in any particular hour. So especially when you are playing a slow game like live poker, you are going to feel card dead a lot because you may go 30 or 40 minutes without anything reasonable at all. And this takes us to step number one in how to win when you are card dead. And it is to simply fold a lot. Do not get impatient. Do not think that you need to get in there and battle hard and try to win every single hand because you don't. Take a look at this graph here. This graph shows three-handed on the button. If everyone folds to you with six big blinds, what should you do? This is just an example of how you can go about thinking about poker. In this scenario, if you take a look at this, this the hands in green are going to be profitable. Pocket aces profits a lot. Pocket twos profits less than that. Uh, five, four suited profits almost nothing. Okay? This shows that all of these hands that are kind of marginal are essentially break even. While you may win an individual hand by jamming with the jack four suited, you should expect to lose a little bit of money on average. Same thing with this 10 7 offsuit, right? They fold to you six big blinds on the button. You should probably just fold. Whenever you have bad cards or even slightly suboptimal cards, you should usually just get out of the way. And this becomes perhaps even more true as you get deeper and deeper, deeper stacked, especially as your opponents play better and better. Because then whenever you do play the you know, nine, six offsuit from the button, what's gonna end up happening is even though you're in position, you're playing a hand that is so incredibly bad that you're gonna make a lot of middle and bottom pairs and middle and bottom pairs are not really where you wanna be, especially against players who play very well post-flop who are also kind of aggressive because they're gonna make you fold out a lot of your middle and bottom pairs by the river. So you're gonna find that you simply need to fold a lot. If you are in there playing too wide Unless you are exploiting your opponents because they play too weak and tight, it's just not going to work out for you. I have GTO charts available on the PokerCoaching.com app. You can pull them up while you're, you know, anywhere. When you're uh, on the train, on the bus, probably not when you're driving. Um, when you're at the poker table, if your casino allows it. If you're playing online, some sites don't allow it. Don't break the rules of your site because bad things will happen. But you should be consistently referencing whatever tools are legally available where you play to make sure that you're playing as well as possible. And we have charts for all sorts of scenarios, tournaments, cash games, shallow stack, deep stacked. It's also available on the pokercoaching.com website. So be sure you get the poker coaching app and look at the GTO preflop charts. And if you somewhat rigidly stick to those, at least for your initial opening ranges, you're going to be perfectly fine. Once you've been card dead for a while though, it's important to realize that you will have perhaps an image of a tight player. Now, if you're a 25-year-old kid who many players are going to naturally suspect is going to be a little bit loose and a little bit aggressive, your opponents are not going to think that you are just a weak, tight player. They're probably going to think you've just been card dead, right? But if you have a very tight image, maybe you're an older player who are usually thought to be a little bit on the tighter side, maybe you're dressed incredibly conservatively, if you are giving off the image that you are tight and you've been tight because you've been card dead, right? You just haven't played a hand in an hour and a half. You should slightly widen your range and three bet a little more often because people are likely to fold against you because they're going to presume that your range is much stronger than it actually is. 
Here's one of these GTO charts that's available in the app for all of you. And this is a scenario where 40 big blinds, we're in the cutoff against a hijack raise, raise first in. So everyone folds to the hijack seat, which is, you know, it goes uh, big blind, small blind, button, cutoff, hijack. Okay, so middle position in a nine-handed table. They raise, you're in the cutoff, the position to the right of the button. The hands in red, 40 big blinds deep, should be re-raised small. The hands in green should be called. And the hands in blue should be folded. Okay, this is the perfect game theory optimal strategy. If you stick to this, you will probably be fine. Obviously, you should adjust whatever your opponent's doing correctly. In this scenario, you'll find a very common pattern is you re-raise with all of your best hands, aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, ace, king, ace, queen, sometimes, ace, queen suited. And then some hands that are good, but perhaps not quite good enough to call, often that have decent playability. That's going to be some suited aces, some suited kings, some of your weaker suited connected type hands, and then some big blocker cards like ace, jack, ace, ten, king, jack, etc. And the plan here is to re-raise these best hands in red at the top, planning to call it off, and then you're going to re-raise these weaker hands in this vicinity, planning to fold if your opponent shoves. And then you're calling with all the hands that flop pretty well. Okay? Standard stuff. If this is unfamiliar to you, check out my fundamentals course. It's completely free. You can get that at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. Fine. Here's the GTO strategy. What should you do if you have been on the tight side and you think your opponents are going to think that you are on the tight side? Well, you should widen your range a little bit. So you're essentially just going to include more bluffs in your range. So notice in this scenario, the hands in red are something like eh, jacks and better and ace-queen suited and better. So notice we have jacks and better, ace-queen suited. So we're three-betting the same value range pretty much. Uh, maybe we could include tens here. But then notice that hands like ace-jack and king-jack and ace-ten are called sometimes and re-raised sometimes. They're mixed, right? But we exploitatively are going to re-raise those hands every single time as a bluff. Same thing with a lot of these other hands that are partially selected in red over here. We're going to be re-raised bluffing them every time. And that's essentially going to make us bluff a little bit more often than your opponents will expect you to. And if they are going to overfold to you, this is going to result in little bits of equity being pushed your direction. If you think your opponents are going to play really tightly against you, maybe because they're raising super wide to begin with because they think you're really tight, and they do think you're really tight, so they're going to fold your re-raise, maybe you want to start re-raising even more as a bluff. Maybe you want to start re-raising even some hands that are not quite on the chart, like um, King-7 suited, King-6 suited. 8-7 suited, 9-7 suited, 7-6 suited, queen-jack offsuit, king-10 offsuit, ace-9 offsuit, right? That said, you can't be insane, right? If you go back over here to a chart like this, it kind of shows how unprofitable some hands are. Like, if you take a hand like 10-8 offsuit and play it, it's losing, but it's like barely losing. And if your opponents are going to overfold to you, it's probably okay. But if you take a hand like 7-4 offsuit and start playing it, now you're, there's like almost no way to recoup that substantial disadvantage you're starting from. So you can't just go around three betting absolute garbage. Some people have, call them pet hands, that they think are lucky for them or special for them. Like they always re-raise the jack three suited, let's say. Why? I don't know, because they won with it one time, a long time ago. Don't do anything like that. That is ridiculous. But you can widen your bluffing range just a little bit in a lot of spots, and that's usually going to be okay. And to be fair, if you think your opponents generally overfold to aggression to begin with, or you think they do not four bet often enough, like in this scenario, if you think they don't four bet all in often enough, you can three bet wider for value because they're either going to fold or call a lot. And if they call and you have a hand like jack nine suited, it's fine. You're going to flop something. You're going to be in position. And you're going to play reasonably well post flop. Step number three, you have to develop a strong mindset. It's important to realize that a penny saved is a penny earned. Saving chips by reducing unprofitable plays in your overall strategy is just as important as building a stack and taking the profitable spots whenever you are playing poker. Every time you make a decision, you either win or lose money. And if you consistently make plays where you lose money, well, you're going to lose. Great players do not worry when they're card dead because they understand that it's part of the game. Everyone's going to get the same cards in the long run. Poker is a long run game. I say it a million times on this channel. All you really have to do to win at poker is find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. But most people are overly concerned with the short-term variance of the game. I mean, if you go play at a casino for six hours, you may only play 200 hands. That's almost nothing. You may only get to play two or three big hands over the course of 200 hands. And if you lose two out of three, well, sorry, you're probably going to have a losing session. That's just how it goes. 
Understand that that is part of the game, and that is why the game is so profitable. If there was no variance, if you could just win all the time, well, that means somebody's just losing all the time, and the game would quickly die out, or at least not be played for substantial money. So whenever you are at the table and card dead, just stay focused and present in the situation, because at any point in time, the cards could shift. Not that you can have any way of predicting that, but you can easily go from being card dead for a while to playing a bunch of hands in a row, and you need to be in there making intelligent decisions. I mean, this happened to me during the World Series of Poker main event this year. I was card dead for like three hours. I got literally nothing to work with. And then all of a sudden, I just got a whole bunch of playable hands to the point that my opponent started to think I was a lunatic. They thought I was super tight. Didn't think I'm trying to run them over. And it's an interesting spot. But whenever you are in a lot of hands back to back to back to back, it's easy to, I guess, have an adrenaline rush and get excited and inevitably perhaps make a poor decision. So you want to make sure that you are always focused and just trying to make the best decision at each decision point in a hand. And if you do that on every single decision point you have at the poker table and you play well and you've studied and you've worked out hard away from the table, then you will thrive. So how do you win when you're card dead? You stay disciplined and perhaps you get a little bit looser to take advantage of this perhaps tight image that you've developed. But what you do not do is you do not lose your mind and try to win every pot, which is what torches a lot of less disciplined players stacks. So that's me for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, do me a quick favor and click the like and subscribe button below. Also, let me know if you have any strategies for dealing when you are card dead. Are there any particular plays that you found worked great for you? I'm happy to hear them. I'm always happy to learn from all of you. Good luck in your games. Have a great week. If you want to study more, make sure you check out PokerCoaching.com and get the Poker Coaching app so that you know what good, strong, fundamentally sound ranges look like. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.